You may have seen we fitted Starlink in a recent episode and I promised a comprehensive run through of our experience with it. So here it is. Just going to turn it on for the first time. I'm powering it through uh, our EcoFlow unit here because I actually want to see how much it draws when it uh, starts to to get going. I'm going to do some modifications to it as well. Uh, probably not going to do the DC modification uh, at the moment. I need some, some stuff uh, to, to be able to do that. Uh, you're going to have to cut the cables off the end and all that sort of stuff and it's, it's a bit of a major job but I'm definitely going to disable the motors on this thing so I'd like to see how much it draws uh, at the moment with the motors going and then see what it's like with, with the moth. Okay so got it powered up. I just want to take a, a note of what it's drawing and if I put this up I've got it on the app and put it up there so you can see so at the moment yeah, it seems to be going between about 40 and I just saw a glimpse of 70 then a minute ago 43 so this is just it uh, powering up the electronics when it moves the motor we'll see what it does um, there is uh, some sort of function on here to to clear sort of snow and ice that heats it up which is obviously going to use a lot i don't know if it's clever enough to know it doesn't need that i hope so it doesn't use it but i've heard mixed reports about that so there's a quick blast of 70 there but it didn't move that wasn't the that wasn't the motors yeah it'd be interesting to see when it does move how much that is going to do i'm going to disable the motors on this uh, you can drill a little hole you can find the instructions online and just with a pair of tweezers pull out the plug that, that goes to the motors just to disable it and, and keep it flat because it's a phased array so it doesn't need to, to move to track satellites that's not what it does it normally does its initialization and it ends up pointing sort of north getting a, as good a signal as it can if there's something in the way sort of trying to move around that um, but yeah when you're at sea and you're moving around all the time of course you don't need that and what happens is that if you're if you are moving every now and again it thinks it needs to reconfigure and and will, will drop out the internet while it does that which is which is a pain so you don't want it to do that so that's the main reason but also I'm just thinking well if it's powering up the motors to move it's going to be using more power and I could do with using as less power as possible so I'll do that um, eventually I will do the the tweak on this I haven't got the right gear at it for the moment but to, to put it on DC at the moment I've got it plugged into the back of this so it's running off the inverter off the eco flow but it'd be great if it could just run you know directly off 12 volts it's a 48 volt system so you just need to step it up to that but it'd be nice to be able to do that and obviously there are some hacks available to be able to do that so still looking at this still taking what 47 49 50 watts so it's a fair bit I mean you know these these things aren't aren't great for uh, <laughs> for power usage I don't think we're going to be keeping it on all the time we'll have it on when we need it and turn it off when we don't I think because uh, yeah that's sort of taken as much as a small fridge oh it's moving oh look at that and, and it went down as it moved see I saw this earlier 33 32 while it's moving so it must turn something else off while it's using the motors what's that about what's that about that as it moves it uses less it must be that it shuts off all of its other systems as it moves so actually that that 20 odd amps 20 odd watts is is just for its uh, is just for its motors and it's got everything else powered down at that time but that's that's a weird one i was sort of expecting it to go up to a, you know over 100 watts as it, as it moved around but it but it didn't so it looks like it's there that's initialized that's done its thing so now I've got to fool it into going directly upwards, which you can do by turning it upside down apparently, and, uh, and, then, and then, yeah, unplug it so it's stuck in that position and, and unplug its motors. So I've turned it on, turned it upside down, got in a position where I can whip the, uh, the cable out quickly as soon as this is straight because I just want to lock it off in that position. So yeah, we just have to wait for it to start its initialization. Didn't quite catch it vertical. Have another go. <sighs> I think that's pretty good. Almost straight. It's not exactly there, but near enough. Tiny little bit of slope. The water will run off it better. So, yeah, that's okay. I'll uh, go on with the next stage. So you might notice I've already got a mark on here with some tape. That's the uh, the place that I want to drill through. If you look online, basically people are saying five inches, which is 12.7 centimeters in from both edges. You mark that point. Now it looks to me that when people have done that and drilled the hole, it ends up being slightly over here. So I'm gonna 
I'm going to sort of aim a little bit off just over there because I'm actually drilling a reasonably small hole. Uh, people are drilling an inch, inch wide holes. Uh, I've got a, a 12 mil force and a bit here. This is the best, the best bit to use because it hasn't got the, you know, the big sticky out bit that the auger bits have, have got to uh, that might catch on anything inside. You know, you don't obviously when you want to go through here, you mustn't push hard and actually damage any of the board that's inside there so it's got to be a careful thing to go through so I'll try with this with the 12 mil um, and then hopefully it'll be a big enough hole that I can get through with the tweezers and just uh, pull out the plug that, that goes to the motors. Okay, well that was scary, but it's through. It's uh, slightly thicker than I thought, actually. It's probably about, I don't know, that's that four mil, three, three and a half mil thick, that casing. And I was right to, uh, to do it this way. In fact, to be exactly on, I think it would be, the middle hole of the hole would be about here. So yeah, I would, I would definitely come over a little bit more than the uh, five inches this way, five and a half inches definitely to, uh, to be right at the top of it. But I think I'm close enough to get to it. Might not be a big enough hole with these tweezers, but I'll have a fiddle, see if I can pull it out. Okay, well I managed to pull it out. It comes out that way. So you just, you just pull it across a little bit. And I'll uh, find a grommet for this hole. But before I do that, I'm gonna uh, plug it back up and just make sure all still works. So it has stayed horizontal, obviously without its motors it can't move. And uh, I can see that uh, Ferrol Starlink has come up, should be connected to the internet. Let's just do a quick speed test. I haven't downloaded the uh, Starlink app on this yet. You can do it. You can do a speed test directly through the, the Starlink app, but I'll just go on the proprietary one, press go. Let's see what we've got. There we go. 60, 61, 62, 70. That's pretty good. It's got a bit of the mast in the way and other stuff. Yeah, look, over 100 megabits per second. So we ended up with a very respectable 144 megabits per second download and 21.1 upload. This figure will depend upon where you are and how many people around are using the system and if you're using the standard or the priority service. We're using the standard here. When it comes to fitting, Starlink don't yet produce anything made for a boat, so people are coming up with their own ideas, some more elegant than others. It's quite a bit of windage, a bit of weight to it, so uh, it needs something fairly substantial. This is the, the, uh, the thing that you get with it, or you can order with it as, a, as an extra. It's, it's meant to mount it on a house, but you know, so it's not ideal. They don't sort of supply anything for putting it on tubing. So yeah, I've just got to cut a piece of teak and bolted that through, and then this is just bolted to uh, to the thick bit of wood, but that seems okay. It's gonna sit there flat like that because I have disabled the motors. I've got to finish off uh, just doing all the cabling which is gonna come through here and down. And it goes into uh, the aft cabin. Uh, and it's quite a long cable, so it could come all the way through and into the saloon uh, and it probably will do eventually. At the moment, I've got it back in the, uh, back in the aft cabin and the, the, so the router's there, but I think the router seems to be good enough to, to uh, to do the whole boat, it goes through, I'll show you where it, where it is. So the cable comes down in that cabinet there and it has to come all the way through here. Lots of drilling of holes. But at the moment I'm powering it from this, the router is under there in the dark. Okay, so you can see it really is a power hungry beast this, look at that taking 54, 48, 41, sometimes it goes up to about 58 watts. It is a lot. I was hoping it would be less when I, once I've got the, uh, the motors off, but it doesn't seem to be. Um, but yeah, let's have a look at other stuff. Have a look at the, the app. I'll put this up on screen. Uh, does statistics showing you if there's any dropouts and outages and things like that. Um, obstructions, you can. If you're mounting this at home, you'd go around and use the camera in your phone or your iPad or whatever, and it sort of scan the sky and tell you the best place to put it. Well, I haven't really got any choices on the boat, so you know it is where it is, but it is collecting um, some data, it says. It'll take another five hours. So it'd be interesting to see, because obviously the mast is the only thing that's sort of in its way where it's mounted at the moment, but it is flat as well. So you know, let's see if that makes any difference to it. Um, you can go speed test. 
I mean, basically, it always just goes around and hits the end stop. It's it's great. So usually over 200 megabits per second. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can't say fairer than that. But it depends on where you are in the world. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can look at what you're getting from the router to your device. And I'm not sure how this is working well, because I get the warning up sometimes, even when I'm sitting next to it, saying, um, you know, you consider re replacing, re you know, moving your router to a, to a better spot. I'm sitting right next to it now. So let's have a look, check Wi-Fi range. You can do this quite cool thing. I'll show you. It, shows, it looks around. I go around the boat. The boat is a mess at the moment. I'm sorry about that, but uh, that's what it's like when you're on the hard. But yeah, it's showing you this little map of little green dots of, of where it's good. So green is good, good signal, good signal. So I'm coming around to the nav station type area now, and yeah, it's, ooh, it's going yellow. And if I come in here and actually sit down at the saloon table where the oh. Well, the computer is, yeah, it goes red. And it's been doing that before, showing red. But then actually when I go on and um, and have a look to see what the actual speed is, the speed still seems pretty good. I'll try and test it again here. If you go in the speed test, I think you need, I'm going to have to wait, I think, to go through to the advanced test. Start advanced test. And it'll do the speed from the router to the internet. Um, so that's, yeah, the downlink. Uh, and then it's going to do the Wi-Fi speed from the, uh, from the router to, to the device. Now it's looking at the Wi-Fi speed. Now look at that. <laughs> it's saying that the device to, to Wi-Fi router is actually faster than the downlink speed. It's doing brilliantly well. And this, I'm still, still sitting in the area that was red before. And I've, I've done it several times and it just gives me different things every, every time. So I'm not sure that this is accurate at all. It seems to work absolutely fine. I've got the uh, the computer just sat in here and this is where I use it most of the time and it's it's always been fast and brilliant. So yeah, I don't think that's an issue. Okay, so the big question is really how does it actually work when you're out sailing? Well, we are now currently 500 nautical miles offshore out into the Atlantic. We're actually just approaching uh, Madeira in the distance there. And uh, it's worked brilliantly well. Uh, we, uh, we came through a massive storm as well. We had uh, 50 knot winds sustained for, for two days and uh, it stayed up the whole time, still there, because we were getting weather forecast. So it must have a fairly good aerodynamic shape to it. Um, but yeah, first of all then, uh, setting it up then, going through your, your menus. Uh, we did actually find the snow melt thing, first of all. So do, do turn that off. Uh, you'll find it in the settings there and uh, yeah, just slide the thing over. So that's never, never gonna come on because you don't really want that. Uh, and then go into your settings for what tariff you want. You do all this in the app, it's all there, it's all fairly easy. So the first one we went for was the uh, regional priority that uh, gives you uh, the cheapest way really of doing it if you're, if you're on the hard, like we were in, in, a, in a marina or just coastal sailing because we then came out, did some coastal sailing along uh, Portugal and that tariff, worked absolutely fine, it's definitely the cheapest way of doing it and the coastal sailing is, is all you need. But then going offshore, if you want to be sure that it, it works there, you need one that is going to work out in the ocean. Uh, it's three times the price, but, but this one, the mobile priority, is the, is the one to go for. It's all the cheapest way of doing it uh, to be out in the ocean. It's done the job brilliantly, it was a lifesaver for us because we really needed those uh, weather forecasts with the weather systems we came against and, and we could use it anywhere. So yeah, really pleased with that. Um, it's limited to 50 gigs, which is a bit of a shame. Um, but, so you've got to be a little bit careful, but you can buy extra gigabytes. I think it's about $2, $2 a gigabyte or something if you want to buy extra ones on that tariff. Um, and then when we get back to coastal sailing, we'll switch back to the, uh, the cheaper tariff. Uh, we still have the question mark about once we cross the Atlantic, what's going to happen because the regional one is for us, for Europe. So I think we're going to have to change its, uh, its address, its contact address to uh, an American address uh, to be able to, to stay on that and not go to the very expensive global one. But yeah, we'll, we'll see when that comes on. So yeah, overall, absolutely brilliant. We, come, we did come across one problem with it, which was um, using some of the, uh, the apps offshore, things like uh, uh, Predict Wind on a... On a a tablet and things like that, which are taking the GPS. If it takes the GPS from this thing, um, it doesn't know where you are. It, it was actually putting us back in Lagos. It obviously got a fix there, and that's where it, it thought we were, because it doesn't get just fixes as you go along from, from GPS, it seems, that, that it can use. So we've had to sort of fiddle around and uh, try and fool the, the tablet into to being not on Wi-Fi, uh, but it has to, has to be on Wi-Fi to get the data, but then not take the GPS from that. So it was 
lots of fiddling, switching backwards and forwards. I actually took it through a different system we had on board, the Orca in the end, and I managed to get that to work, but it's very fiddly. So if anyone knows a way of making sure that different apps on your tablets and your phones and things uh, don't take the, the GPS system from the, uh, the, the Starlink, which is going to put you somewhere where you're not, uh, then, then do let us know, put it in the comments and we'll try and find a, you know, the best way of setting this up so you're working offshore and you're not using the, uh, Star Pest, the Starlink uh, GPS. One thing it would be good to know is boot up time because we are regularly turning off the system to save power. For us it seems to take between about 5 and 10 minutes to reacquire. This is firing up in the conditions you see here, moving a lot, and it took about 8 minutes. I'd be interested to know how that compares with the ones with the motors still attached. But yeah, overall, absolutely fantastic, really good buy, I think, uh, expensive but worth the money, so all we've got to say is thank you, Elon. It takes hours to put these films together, and that's only possible if YouTube promotes them. And for that, we need subscribers.